Namaste. So today we're going to go over the Upanishad verse 6. And it's very significant because this is the second verse on Sushupti in Manduk Upanishad. And it's also the first verse on which the Karaka begins. The Karaka, of course, is the commentary by Gaudapada, Shankaracharya's great guru, uh, or grand guru, his guru's guru. <laughs> and Shankara also has wonderful commentaries on these verses. But before we go into that, let's just read the verse and then consider its implications. This one is the Lord of all. This one is omniscient. This one is the inner director of all. This one is the source of all. This one is verily the place of origin and dissolution of all beings. Now, after hearing this, if you're not going, wow, this is huge, this is amazing, this is like completely revolutionary, either you didn't understand it or you didn't really consider its meaning. Let me read it again. This one is the Lord of all. This one is omniscient. This one is the inner director of all. This one is the source of all. This one is verily the place of origin and dissolution of all beings. Now, these qualities and functions are normally, when I say normally, I mean in all other religious writings other than the Upanishads. These functions and characteristics are ascribed to some kind of personal God, isn't it? The creator, the Lord, omniscient, the director, the source, the origin and dissolution of all beings. But what is he talking about? Sushupti consciousness. So this is absolutely revolutionary. It's almost shocking. And of course, the same point of view is expressed more eloquently sometimes and, and certainly at greater length in the Brihadaranyaka Upanishad and other similar Upanishads. But here, because the whole Upanishad is only 12 verses long, it's expressed with extreme economy and in such a condensed form that, I mean, it hits you like, wow, wait a minute. He's talking about God? And this is the same as deep sleep? Whoa. Right? So let's consider this for a minute. How explosively revolutionary, unique this is in the form of, uh, of a religious scripture? Well, of course, actually, this is beyond religion. Because religion, remember, is a function of svapna consciousness, dreams or thoughts. In other words, nobody sees God walking down the street. Although, you know, you can look at all these Baroque paintings of this old man with a long beard, <laughs> sitting on a throne in the clouds, you know, and there's all these cherubim and all flying around, strumming on their harps. <laughs> and he's like very serious, you know, thinking, oh, who am I going to condemn to hell forever today? That's not our version of God. <laughs> That's not the Veda's version of God. The Veda's version is Shiva. Shiva is transcendental. Shiva is beyond this material universe. And the proof is that in the Shiva Purana and other Puranas, Shiva appears to regulate and teach 
Brahma and Vishnu, who are responsible for the creation and maintenance of the universe, respectively. So Shiva is like a super authority. He's like a, a, a transcendent entity that just shows up in the universe whenever he needs to correct something or manage something. And basically, he is the one responsible, ultimately, for the creation. But again, we don't see Shiva, you know, with our ordinary senses. That doesn't mean he doesn't exist, but he exists on a different platform of consciousness. All the gods are like that. You don't see any of the gods. I mean, sure, you see the figures in the temples. But we know those statues are made by human hands. And we hear descriptions in the scriptures, uh, both of them and by them, spoken by them in the scriptures. But aren't these also written by humans? Maybe they are inspired by a higher force, but ultimately it's human beings that set pen to paper and wrote them down. So what this all means is that what we call religion is on the platform of Jagrat, in the case of religious rituals, and Svapna, in the case of the uh, devotion and inner worship of the various deity forms, especially the uh, Ishtadevata, or one's chosen dearmost deity. But I have a secret to share about that. When Ishtadevata is chosen by you, it's usually not the real Ishtadevata. When Ishtadevata chooses you and shows up spontaneously in your consciousness, that's the real Ishtadevata. Like for a long time, I was involved with the Krishna movement. And of course, we were all bombarded with the idea every day, you know, that Krishna is the ultimate God and all of this. But during ecstatic kirtans, when we were dancing and chanting like madmen, I would get these inner visions of this lion-like figure. And this just spontaneously popped into my consciousness. I didn't seek it out. I didn't certainly didn't imagine it. I mean, you know when you're imagining stuff, you know? Like even during an LSD trip, where you have greatly enhanced powers of imagination. Deep down, you know when you're imagining something, which is most of the time. It's very rare that actual spontaneous visions occur, but when they do, they are very authentic, and they should be taken very seriously. Well, I had no idea that this lion-like figure was my Ishtadevata until much, much later. This first happened back in the mid-1970s. And he kept popping into my mind, you know, under various circumstances, but mainly when I was ecstatically chanting some mantra. But then in 2002, 2003, I wanted to know for sure who is my Ishta Devata. Because even though I had visions of Krishna and stuff, it still somehow wasn't completely convincing. Like I had this gnawing doubt that actually I had imagined it. I have a pretty active imagination <laughs> as a creative person. But you know, you always know when you're imagining. So I wanted to know for sure. I sought advice from a very senior sannyasi, not a member of that particular cult, but uh, someone very respected in Vrindavan in India. And he said, well, the Bridgebasi Babaji's, when they want to know for sure, or when they want to attract 
their Ishtadevata, they chant the Kama Gayatri Mantra. Now, as it so happens, I had been initiated into that mantra by my Adi Guru. So I began to chant it as Japa. So after, I don't know, a couple of weeks of chanting this, you know, day and night at every opportunity, I was riding in the streetcar in San Francisco. And again, this lion pops into my consciousness. And I said to him, what are you doing here? <laughs> and he says, well, you keep calling me. So I came. So I was chanting Kama Gayatri Mantra to attain my sankalpa, my desire in chanting it was to attract my Ishtadevata. And this lion-like being shows up and basically claims he is it. Well, it fit. And the more that I contemplated him, uh, the more I was convinced that he is my Ishtadevata. Now, at first I thought he was Narasimhadev, uh, an expansion or incarnation of Vishnu. But then it became clear that he was very interested in things that Vishnu would normally not be a part of, you know, in the modes of passion and ignorance. And so this was perplexing at first. But then again, after many years of study and sadhana and purification and so on, I did have darshan of Shiva. Shiva appeared to me in, my, in a hotel room. I mean, really, these things happen in the most absurd circumstances sometimes. <laughs> Not like I was in some holy place. Well, I was in um, Rishikesh, India. But I was in a hotel, you know, not in a temple or anything like that. Just like before, I was in a streetcar. <laughs> so anyway, it's like, it's like this portal opened up in my consciousness. And Shiva just kind of walked in and said, hey, you want to merge? I mean, really, it was just like that. You want to merge? Come on. So I did over the next few days. And this was really a major, major realization. Um, but what came up after a while of contemplating this relationship with Shiva is that he has exactly the same mood as my lion, which I never called him anything else but lion, because <laughs> I didn't really know who he was, you know, and, and he never volunteered a name. So, you know, lion. And he responded to that. He appeared to have no problem with that. So, OK. He and Shiva had exactly the same mood of what I would call fearless friendship. In other words, in my uh, realizations and visions of Krishna and Vishnu and like that, there was always this kind of hesitation, like, you know, you're not really, uh, you know, by the book sadhaka. Uh, you're a little bit, you know, on the extreme edge. <laughs> and I admit I am because from the beginning I was a tantrika. My mother was a tantrika. She raised me as a tantrika. And I became like that and I lived like that. So for me to have this friendship, this like unhesitating, unconditional, fearless friendship uh, with a, an incarnation of Shiva or a, a form of Shiva, this was like, hmm. That means my lion is an expansion of Shiva. And that resonated. That was like, yeah. <laughs> Deep confirmation. So the point of all this is that the stages of religion in Jagrat and Svapna are real 
in those states of consciousness. But now, this Upanishad is asserting that in the state of Sushupti consciousness, basically, the consciousness itself is the Supreme God. Well, this is absolutely revolutionary. We're used to thinking of God as a person, as a doer, as an agent, as somebody who makes things and manages things and takes decisions. And But here he's saying that this state of consciousness is Brahman, the ultimate source of everything. That's revolutionary. So now let's look at what Shankaracharya has to say in his purports. Eshaha, this one, this pragna, when in his natural state is surely Sarveshwaraha, the Lord of all, of all diversity inclusive of the heavenly world, and contrary to what others believe in, he, the Lord of all, is not something intrinsically different from this one that is pragna, as is borne out by the Vedic text, O good-looking one, the individual soul conditioned by the mind is tethered to, that is to say, has for its goal the vital force, which is Brahman. Chandogya 682. And we'll look at that in a minute. This one, again, in his state of imminence in all diversity, is the knower of all. Hence, Eshaha Sarvagyaha, this one is omniscient. Eshaha, this one is Antaryami, the inner controller. This one becomes the director of all beings by entering inside, Antar. For the same reason, he gives birth to the universe together with its diversities, as described before. And hence, Esha Yonihi, this one is the source, Sarvasya, of all. And since this is so, therefore this very one is He, certainly, Prabhava Apyayo, the place of origin and dissolution, Bhutanam, of all beings. This is so powerful. This is so deep. This is so surprising in its directness. Because after all, we all enter into Sushupti every single night. And the advanced yogis enter into Sushupti, the meditators, when they go deep in following the Raja Yoga of Neti Neti, until they finally arrive at the void, emptiness, nothingness. So this consciousness itself is what we call colloquially God. That fits exactly with what Jesus says, the kingdom of heaven is within you. And of course, where is God? In the kingdom of heaven. So if the kingdom of heaven is within us, so is God. This, again, is revolutionary. huh? It, it causes my hairs to stand on end. It's so wild. But it has the ring of truth. Now, let's go take a look at that verse, that Brihadaranyaka verse. Now, let's go have a look at that Chandogya Upanishad verse. Just as a bird tied to a string, having flown in several directions and finding no resting place elsewhere, settles down at the place to which it is fastened, so also the mind, my dear, flying in several directions and finding no resting place elsewhere, settles down at the life breath. Because, my boy, the mind is fastened to the life breath. Now, this follows verse 1, which reads, Udalaka Aruni said to his son, Shvetaketu, Ketu, 
Learn from me, my dear, the ultimate stage of sleep. When a man is said to be sleeping, then, my dear, does he become imbued with being and goes to his own. Hence, people say he sleeps, svapiti, because he is gone to his own. Svap means one's own, like Sva karma means one's own karma. Sva rupa means one's own form, the real form, the real nature of the self. So here also, that when a being goes to sleep, he goes into svapna. Okay? He goes into what is colloquially called dreaming. But actually it means he goes to his real nature. He merges into the life breath. And isn't it interesting that during sleep, even deep sleep, our breathing continues on its own. And for this reason, in many Vedas and Upanishads, the life breath is considered to be the manifestation of Brahman. And indeed, when the breath leaves the body, the body dies, just within a few minutes. So death is often accompanied by a gradual decrease in breathing, and then finally at the end, cessation of the breath. Now we're going to go into this in tremendous detail in a future series when we do the next chapter of Brihadaranyaka 434, which deals with the process of transmigration. I was reading it last night and it's just amazing, mind-blowing in its tremendous detailed description of the process of death and transmigration of the soul. But what comes out of that discussion, maybe I'll have to look up the verse and, and post it, stick it in here somehow, that when the being, when the higher bodies, the subtle body, withdraws from the physical body, then the organs expand until they permeate the entire universe. How is this? That the organs functioning is due to the action of the demigods. For example, the eye is managed by the sun. Speech is managed by fire. And so on, so on. This is why in fire ceremony, I'm getting too ecstatic now. In fire ceremonies, there are so many mantras chanted. It's not an accident. It's not arbitrary. It's not just some arcane religious form from an ancient civilization. It reflects a universal reality that fire is what powers speech. Similarly, the other organs are each powered by their own demigods. There are 33 million demigods. And so many of those are the forces behind the bodily organs. So because they're demigods, they have universal authority over those functions. So when the body or when the self withdraws from the body and the body organs become inactive, they go with the soul in subtle form. And because these subtle forms of the organs are linked to the demigods that control them, they are all pervading. It is not that, as some people theorize, the uh, subtle organs like kind of collapse or condense around the soul, around the awareness, the consciousness, and then one goes to another place to take a new body based on one's karma and so on. And then they expand again into the physical organs of that body. No, this is specifically argued against by Shankara in his uh, 
purports on these verses. But rather, what happens is that the organs, the subtle organs, expand to the size of the universe. And then, when the new body is decided upon by karma and higher authorities and the confirmations of one's own self, which is Brahman, of course, then again, the organs condense into a physical form and create a new body in a suitable womb. You see, <laughs> our common sense is driven by our material experience. And so the, the common sense religious ideas of all these subtle things are actually wrong. It is not that, you know, God is somewhere far away in some heaven seated on a throne and issuing orders to everybody. That's not it at all. No. God is within. The kingdom of heaven is within. Within means within the heart. And there are quotes like, I can't remember the exact citation, but the space within the heart where Antaryami is located is bigger than the space outside, bigger than the universe. Why? Because it's Brahman. And Brahman does not move or change. Brahman is free from all transformation. So it is not that transmigration from one body to another involves the self moving. <laughs> the self does not move. It does not change. Rather, after the demise of the body, the organs expand to the size of the universe, and then they contract again into a localized form when the next body is chosen and then created. This is the way things actually work. This is why the Upanishads were taught in secret, in the forest, to highly qualified aspirants only, those who are candidates for the supreme enlightenment. But in this day and age, when Vedic civilization is in steep decline, even in India, and so many spurious materialistic cults are springing up and teaching things contrary to the Vedas, uh, the, what I mentioned before, the, the Krishna cult is a good example, then these secrets are broadcast, as it were, from the rooftops. In other words, publicly, openly, broadcast on, you know, YouTube even. <laughs> because now there is, the whole system of choosing suitable candidates has broken down. And the only thing left that by chance or by divine arrangement, those who are actually qualified in this day and age will hear these instructions and will realize the truth of them and understanding them, meditate on them, and thereby enter that state which we know as self-realization, the highest enlightenment. Aung Tatsa. Aung Shakti Aung. Aung Namah Shivaya.